Okay, so we continue. So it's, uh, it's the same set of pores instead of the current speed drop. Okay, and we need to do more inside on the Okay, okay, great. Well, well um, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ian, for, for, for being here. Um, so in regards to Jeff's comments, I, I wanted to say that I, I got involved in uh, uh, a, a comment to a PRL that was, uh, it's on my website. You can go take a look at it and follow the thread around and just <laughs> see for yourself. But uh, it, it was it was an amazingly uh, time costly expenditure to try to clean up something that was, you know, absolute crap. You know, just like complete crap. Not just like oh, I, there's a subtle thing that's not right here. It was just total total junk, and ended up on the cover of PRL. And it's just like it, it was a mystery to me that something so profoundly stupid could be could be published up there. But anyway, so we can talk about that over beer uh, another time. So. I was going to continue to tell you more about uh, back, our back action evading measurements and um, you know how we've been developing these these things along the way and problems that we've encountered. And the, the major the major problem is parametric instability. And um, so parametric instabilities. If you have a simple harmonic oscillator and you modulate one of the parameters of the oscillator, so the frequency. So if you modulate the, the frequency of the oscillator at twice the natural frequency then there, you can end up with this kind of parametric amplification or deamplification. And that's usually explained as uh, the kind of thing you do when you're on a swing set. So when you're on a swing set, you swing your legs. And somehow, everyone says that, and that's convincing, it's apparent to the casual observer, that that, that somehow makes a parametric amplifier by moving your legs on a swing. That never, I've never understood. Um, but what I do understand is what I found in a book uh, a long time ago, oops, was, um, was this, I just wanted to share it, it's kind of fun. So it's a neat thing to remember. So suppose you have a LC oscillator. And one of the plates of the oscillator you can actually pull on and move. Okay. So this LC oscillator, the charge is sloshed back and forth, like what Steve Gerber was saying. And there's a particular phase of the oscillator where all the charge is built up on the capacitor, and there's no current to Okay, So that's a particular moment in the oscillation. So at that particular moment, there's a force between the capacitor plates. Okay. So imagine that I, I have this capacitor, and it's at that particular moment in the oscillation, and I pull the plate apart. So I move the plate from this spot to, uh, to this position here. So the voltage, if you actually look at the voltage versus time, so the voltage builds up, and the voltage when it's a maximum is when all the charge is there. And at that particular moment when the charge is, when there's no current flowing, and the charge is built up, I pull the plate up a little bit, the charge is fixed, and the, uh, the electric field in between a capacitor plate is at the end of distance. So when I pull it, I actually have to do work against the, the force between the plates. And in fact, the voltage increases. Because the distance between the plates increases, the electric field is constant, so the integral of e dot dl is now increased, so the voltage increases. So when I move the plate forward, the volt that particular moment in time, the the, the, um, the voltage increased, the energy stored in the capacitor actually increased due to the work I was doing. So then I, I pulled that plate up, and then I let uh, the oscillator come back down. Now there's no charge, uh, zero charge there and I let the plate go back to its initial position. Okay. So here was the original voltage. But now it's going to oversheet that. So I did a little work. And then at that next negative cycle, where these charges are now flipped, the capacitor plates are back to the original position. I do another cycle. I pull it up. And in fact, there's another increase in voltage. And so you can see by just pumping this thing, uh, pulling up the, the plates, pulling it up when there's a voltage on the plate, and then relaxing when there's no voltage, I essentially am doing work into this LC oscillator. And the energy grows. That's a parametric uh, amplifier. That's essentially the physics of how externally I do work and can pump up an oscillation. And I have to do it at twice the, the frequency of the oscillation. So if that made sense to you, there you go. That's a way to understand the swing set thing that I've never understood, how you move your legs and move. But this, I can understand work, 
charges, plates, and that's making sense. Okay. Okay, so that's a parameter, uh, parameter amplifier. And if you do it at the wrong phase, if I do it, uh, you know, 90 degrees out of phase, if I let the, let the plates go back down at the wrong time, I can, I can actually decrease the uh, amplitude. And I can take work out of this LC oscillator. So depending exactly the timing of your, of your pumping this thing, you can either get, you know, increase or decrease the energy in the LC oscillator. So there you go. So if you modulate this, the frequency at twice the frequency of oscillation, you can either make something grow if you do it enough, or you can, you can suck energy out. That's, that's parametric amplification. OK, so going back to our BAE scheme, the kind of classic BAE scheme is uh, these kind of two-tone measures, right? So you have your LC oscillator at high frequencies, let's say 5 gigahertz. You have your mechanical oscillator at 5 megahertz. You, you can pump wherever you want, but you set up your pumps so that the upconverted from the red side, the upconversion from the mechanical motion goes into the cavity. There's a downconverted piece which is more or less irrelevant. And then on the blue side, there's a downconverted piece that goes into the cavity. And then uh, there's this other upconverted part that's not relevant. In practice, we apply two separate microwave tones, and we carefully overlap the up and down converted tones. Now you can separate them, right? Because those are those the up and down converted pieces are actually the mechanical motion, which might be, let's say, tens of tens of hertz wide. The cavity is 100 kilohertz wide. So the cavity is looking like this big, broad resonance. And I can put these little mechanical sidebands wherever I want. So I can overlap them carefully, or I can pull them apart and actually have red and blue go going on, but no BAE. And that's very useful, because with the two tones, I will, I will get no net damping if I apply both tones. But I'm making a position detector, just setting the full motion if, they're not, if the up and down converted pieces are not overlapped. And it's useful for actually determining if you have a, a, this kind of parametric amplifying effect going on. OK, so, just to, so that's where we were. Let me go down a few slides. Everything was looking good, right? Everything, uh, the BAE scheme was, it was uh, phase sensitive. We dealt with the phase noise of our source. Um, we showed it was back action abating, right? We pumped noise into the cavity. And then, and then we actually started to really turn up the pumps to get some real, uh, to get some real um, sensitivity on the single tone. So this is a, this is a curve uh, similar to the curve that we published in, in Nature Physics, which shows a whole bunch of different pump configurations. You, so you can pump with a single tone red. You can pump with a single tone blue. You can pump with red plus blue but not overlap. Or you can pump with red and blue and do the overlap. So that's, that's all the data points here. So the red points are just standard single tone measurement. Um, eventually, you know, so this is the position resolution versus how many pump photons are in the little microwave resonator. And this is on this axis here is our resolution of a single, either a single quadrature or the full motion normalized by the zero point level. And if you pump with a single red tone, so everything's looking good. And uh, eventually you start damping the resonator and you start Eventually, the sensitivity, your position sensitivity saturates. OK, that's fine. If you pump, then you go right to the two-tone overlapping. You're like, yeah, this is great. Let's, uh, let's, let's, we won't see any damping. We should just keep cruising and get below the zero point level, just turning up the pump power. And like I said, that's the purple points, the dark blue kind of purplish points. And there's something just hugely, hugely bad that happens. And you hit like a brick wall where uh, the line, essentially what we see is the line width narrowing dramatically. The mechanical uh, occupation diverges, and uh, eventually, if you go beyond this point, uh, the, amp the, the amplitude of motion just goes wild. So there's some parametric instability that appears. There's some instability. It, it, it became clear that it was a parametric instability by un, un detuning a little bit the red and blue, and uh, that's that's this line, these black points here, and you you, you don't get to this uh, purple stuff. And in further measurements that we had done, we could get we get a little bit beyond that and actually show that yeah we, we don't we don't see this instability. Okay. So what was going on here in this particular uh, case? It was it's the role of the nonlinearity in the coupling. Okay. So this is uh, for a capacitor. 
uh, classic effect. And uh, nanomechanics has come a long way. Uh, I'll tease my colleagues here saying that you could get a paper in nature based on this, this uh, capacitive spring effect uh, a little over 10 years ago. And the, the spring effect I'm talking about is if I have a capacitive element and I have a DC voltage on it, right? And one of the elements is a subharmonic oscillator. So it turns out that there's a softening, a spring, a spring constant softening that's caused by Can you, having, use, can you use black or oh, black? Yeah. So, be great. Thanks. Sure. I got purple. <laughs> Oh, that, that? Better. Okay, that's better. So imagine you have a simple harmonic oscillator. But then, uh, you know, there's also a DC voltage on these plates. So there's some distance where there's uh, electrostatically, there's, you know, there's a divergence in the, in the potential energy as these plates get closer. So there's a spring constant that's resisting the, the, the plates moving. There's an electrostatic thing when you apply a DC voltage that's saying, hey, they, they should stick together, right? So when you add these two guys together, the curvature of this one is opposite the curvature of the subharmonic oscillator. So when you add the two together, you actually get a parabola that's been displaced and is slightly broader. And so the frequency of oscillation uh, goes down, right? It just kind of softens. And eventually, if you apply a big enough DC voltage, you pull this thing so far over that you get an effect like that. And then any, further, any voltage further than that, it just the plates snap together. But before you get to snapping, as you apply DC to the DC voltage, you'll uh, pull, the, pull the plates closer together and you'll soften the oscillator. So that's an electrostatic spring constant effect. And as you can see in the math from just the force, the derivative of the force between two plates is just the second derivative here of the, the spring constant is just going to be the second derivative of the capacitance. The G, which is the coupling constant for the optical mechanical circuit, is the first derivative of the capacitance. So this is the next term out in the expansion of the capacitance, and um, it ends up causing this spring constant effect. Okay, it goes as V squared. So here's a measurement of that electrostatic spring constant uh, in this kind of optical, optical mechanical circuit. So the, the way this measurement is done is uh, you, you, you put your tone red, and you measure where the peak appears for your upconverted mechanical peak, and that tells you that this that frequency difference tells you the mechanical frequency. And you can you can change exactly where you're putting this red tone, and you can scan this peak through the cavity. And if you scan the peak through the cavity, you see this nice optical spring effect. This is what Ash, Ash was talking about before. But you also see on the background as the power goes up as you go through the cavity, uh, as, sorry, as the red tone gets more and more uh, transmission into the cavity, we also see a, 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 a trend downward, and that can be easily fit using this kind of spring constant effect. So there's two frequency pullings. There's the electrostatic spring constant, and then there's the cavity component here. So when you do two-tone measurement, you have the uh, electric field inside the cavity being modulated at the mechanical frequency. The power is modulating at twice that frequency. And so the power, the average value of v squared, means that the mechanical frequency is being pulled at twice, <coughs> at twice the mechanical frequency. Right? So the fact that the power inside the cavity is being modulated says that the spring constant of the mechanics is being modulated. And eventually, if, if the spring constant, um, if the modulation of the mechanical frequency is bigger than its line width, you get a parametric instability. Okay? Just, just like what I was showing there. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's essentially what was happening. And it has to do with this kind of small nonlinearity in the in the spring constant. Uh, sorry, in the in the in the in the coupling here. Um, you normally would have thought they'd be completely irrelevant because you know it's it's, it's a very it's a very small effect. But you've essentially balanced away the the first order damping terms from the the red and blue term, right? From the red and blue pump. And all that you're left with is just kind of looking pretty barely at this uh, directly at the second order. So that parametric instability, so is it really a parametric instability? So yeah, we did a bunch of measurements. We never published this stuff, but just to, just to find out what was going on, you could pump uh, red and blue and get this kind of uh, parametric effect happening, uh, carefully adjusting the power to get close to the threshold for the instability. 
We then could apply another tone, just slightly detuned, that we could we could measure to actually study the motion, right? So this is telling you the full full quadratures of motion. And then you can drive the mechanical device uh, using another another source, another lead, and uh, actually study how the mechanical device responds. And so if you can you can measure the mechanical response versus the phase of the driving force relative to the phase of the beat of the two tones. Okay. And in fact, you know, it does classic parametric amplifier stuff where uh, as you get close to the threshold, there's a de-amplified quadrature which starts to approach with the amplification of a half, and then there's an amplified quadrature which really starts to take off. And exactly at the instability, this, or this is a half and this gain is infinite here. Okay. So that's pretty neat, that's good. Uh, if you work through all the math, you find out that the, the, phase, the phase angle of the parametric amplifier amplifying effect should happen at uh, 45 degrees to the back action, to the, to the, to the phase of these two tones. It's kind of unfortunate because it, it, it means that there's you know, X1, and, uh, X1 and X2 were the two, the, you know, the, the coordinate system for doing the BAE. I'm measuring X1, I'm not measuring X2 but your, your parametric instability is actually aligned 45 degrees of that, which is going to contaminate the uh, quadrature that you're trying to do the uh, back excavation with. So it's kind of an unfortunate way that the math works out. So OK, you can, you can see uh, a parametric amplifying effect. Uh, with driven motion, you can also see parametric amplification, deamplification with thermal motion. This is this thermal noise squeezing. Um, same kind of set, pump tone setup, in this case we're not driving it, we just have thermal, thermal noise. And for low pumps, uh, if you actually study the motion of the mechanical device, you can see that it makes some cloud here. And then if you turn up your, your two tones, getting a parametric, really, a parametric effect, you can amplify along one axis, and it's hard to see, but you de-amplify along the orthogonal axis of that. And that's this idea of thermal noise squeezing, where we actually reduce the uh, reduce the fluctuations in one quadrature. When you go through the math of this parametric effect, and it's, it's an it's a interesting thing to do, um, you actually show that this, this spring constant modulation uh, contributes to a damp damping term, but it's a damping term that doesn't add noise. And the damping term can be plus or minus. So it adds to the, it, it changes the damping of the oscillator, but doesn't actually add noise to it. So that's why the thermal motion can, uh, can actually be reduced along one, one axis there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's a lesson. The lesson is, is uh, there are higher order terms in the uh, coupling between the mechanical oscillator and the electrical resonator. And sometimes it really, it appears dominant. It's a, it's a big effect. Uh, with two-tone measurement, this, this second order term becomes really important. All right, so that's the first uh, parametric instability was the role of uh, the nonlinear coupling in the, in the circuit. Um, we went on, we, we, so we moved to Caltech, and uh, we started talking to our friends up at JPL, and uh, they have amazing superconducting materials, you know, beyond just aluminum or niobium. They have uh, these materials, uh, niobium titanium nitride or uh, uh, titanium nitride. They're building all kinds of great astrophysics detectors with it. And they show that uh, in some of these more exotic materials, they have titanium nitride, you can get, make electrical resonators with Qs over 10 million. Okay, so we're like, this sounds good. We should try, we should try messing around with this stuff, and we should start building circuits out of this kind of material. Um, so this was after John had shown how, uh, uh, how you know, great the, the couplings you can get with planar devices, and that the dissipation, electrical dissipation, mechanical, mechanical dissipation could all be low sufficiently low in such kind of circuits. And so, so we were going to make uh, a device using this advanced material in this kind of configuration, which, which is similar to what John Raysons and uh, uh, Condon Meyer were doing, which is, you know, it really, that this geometry and has really extended the, the capability of the field. So here's a device that came out of the fab. You know, fabrication is extremely painful, as it's people who know, who know who do it. Uh, this took about a man year to figure out how to do this. Um, and it was motivated by trying to get to use this incredibly low loss material. So this is a niobium nitride, uh, niobium titanium nitride plate. 
Uh, it's been undercut. This little dome here is um, <coughs> suspended. It's suspended above a counter electrode. That's the little circle that's that's on the plate. That's on the substrate. So there's a little a little dome that can vibrate. So we were finally excited to get something out of fabrication. The the mechanical frequency <coughs> of 10 megahertz uh, had reasonable Q. You know, 120 hertz line it wasn't great, but it was okay. The electrical resonance. So there's the capacitor, and then there's a the spiral inductor was around 7 gigahertz, and it completely stank. So the device that we had hoped was going to be this incredibly low loss device was probably the highest loss device that we ever got. And, uh, and it's just it's just it's visible. So you can't really see it. I guess the red is hard to see, but it was a 600 kilohertz uh, wide internal wasp. Right? It's really terrible. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it was all that we had at the time, and uh, we wanted to see, see how it behaved, so we played around with it. And the coupling constant is, is around 5 megahertz per nanometer, which I think is around a factor of 10 below where uh, John and, and the folks at Jill are at, but was orders of magnitude above the wired devices that we had. So it was a big improvement for us. Okay, so there's kind of the layout of the circuit. You feed microwaves in, there's the LC resonator, and then you tech works out. Here's an example of pumping bread, and then in the cavity, you <coughs> see the thermal noise peak. And then as you turn up, uh, as you change the temperature of the fridge, then the, that thermal noise peak just follows the fridge. So this was different than the devices that I showed you with the wires, where the wires had lots of trouble above 150 millikelvin and started having temperatures that were uh, er you know, erratic and wouldn't thermalize the fridge uh, pretty well. And like I said, our recent measurements with these kinds of domes made of aluminum, they actually hit the thermalized to 9 millikelvin. So it's, it's really a big difference from the wires. Okay, so great. Uh, we do the, 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 the BAE measurements. We set up two tones. We can overlap them. We can set up two tones and not overlap them. And we see the same, same problem, unfortunately. Um, so in this case, here's the uh, occupation of the mechanical resonator versus how hard we're pumping. And there's a point where the mechanical resonator just diverges off there. And it, it, it very much depends on whether you're in the overlapped configuration or the uh, two tones that are that are detuned. Okay. But nonetheless, we could get on imprecision on one quadrature down to around two and a half or three from the zero point level. The experiments that we've done at Cornell with the wires, we got down to around four times the zero point level. So somehow we're always stuck close <coughs> to the zero point level and on the wrong side of this, the wrong side of it. It would be nice if we were on the other Because in principle, you should be able to just plow down below it. <coughs> So what was going on in this device? So there was a huge amount of dissipation in, uh, in, in the electrical resonator. And what we started to notice was that the mechanical frequency depended on the power. So here's as you, you measure the mechanical frequency, it's 10 megahertz, and there's a few hundred hertz shift here as you turn up the power. And notice that this few hundred hertz is, is about comparable to the line width <coughs> of the resonator. The line width was 100 hertz or so. Here's a curve which is pretty ubiquitous in all the measurements we do. Over the last you know, more than 10 years of playing around with this kind of stuff, we always see curves <coughs> like this. Frequency of the mechanics versus temperature. And there's always a, a line you can fit that looks logarithmic to it. We never can measure it over a big enough range to show it. Yeah, it's, like it's log, but it's, uh, it, it fits that. And this is what you expect from uh, standard two-level system physics. So this, it turns out if you take a piece of glass, completely disordered material, and you measure the speed of sound in the glass, it will have a logarithmic component to the shift in the speed of sound. Right? There's a dissipation part that comes from two-level systems, and there's also a, a renormalization of the speed of sound. Okay. Standard crystal, silicon, whatever, is a perfect crystal. There's no change in speed of sound or temperature. All that's long gone at higher temperatures. But for a glass, there is uh, this kind of change. So we get various uh, cues versus the temperature if we measure from under a Kelvin down. But the, the frequency versus temperature is always this kind of curve. Okay. So this is a pretty ubiquitous thing. So it's interesting that you could, you can measure, we tried to measure the temperature of the mechanical oscillator by looking at its frequency. So that's the, um, that's the little crosses. And compared that to the temperature of the mechanical oscillator by measuring its thermal browning motion. So the noise, the, amp, the noise peak that appeared in the cavity. And it turned out that those two trapped each other. Right? 
So we became convinced that, in fact, okay, the device is just heating up. This thing is just getting hot from the power. It's pulling the frequency, and that's apparent both in the noise and also in the frequency. Boring, 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 but uh, there's some interesting lessons in this. For one thing, the, uh, the temperature of such a small thing, if you actually measure the, uh, if you actually compute what you think the uh, thermal relaxation time would be. And the thermal relaxation time we can we can estimate from the heat capacity of the um, of the phonons in the in the drum, and then we measure the thermal resistance by looking at those temperature rises versus power. And it turns out that the th the, the uh, thermal time constant can be under a nanosecond. So what it means is it's 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 like when you're you're applying your microwave tones and you're doing this BAE thing. So the the, the, the microwaves are the power is beating in there. And the temperature of the mechanical device is actually following that high frequency power. So, you know, if somebody shined microwaves on me that had a beat tone at 10 megahertz, I would just see, see some average power. My temperature would not uh, be followed tracking 10 megahertz because my heat capacity is like you know, a day, whatever, my stack. But, the, the, uh, but for this small device, it's got a nanosecond heat capacity, right? So it just, it just tracks. And the fact that it can track means that its frequency can pull back and forth. So that's another lesson, is that small things like this have extraordinarily small, fast thermal relaxation times. Don't, don't forget the fact that the temperature can actually follow, follow fast signals. OK. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's essentially, essentially the lesson that I wanted to, uh, to show there. Um, we did this thermal analysis where you know, we could actually measure the cavity heating up versus the pump power. So here's another non-ideality, is that as you pump harder and harder, you can start to see the cavity get occupied by a few quantum. And this is pretty ubiquitous as well. This is something that we see in our measurements. I think John sees these kinds of things. And ultimately, it's what's limiting a lot of our cooling experiments. Right? So you notice from the slide that Osh had is that the cooling experiments are not on the quantum back action line. Uh, they're off this line. And they're due to the fact that the cavity is getting excited with some thermal some quantum. And I'll have a little more to say about this in a second. But by measuring the occupation of the cavity, you can determine its temperature, and we can look at the mechanical device and determine its temperature. We think we know how much heat's going into the electrical device, so we can build a little thermal model. So we published this in um, Nano Letters just recently, just to kind of show the world that, or you know, maybe it'd be useful to some other people thinking about how heat moves through these electrical circuits. And the, the, the takeaway, that's one of the takeaway messages is that if you're working with very high Q oscillators, mechanical or electrical, uh, it, you know, everything has some temperature dependence to it. And if you're, you have to, you know, if you're moving things by more than it's line width, you can end up having these parametric instability problems. So low dissipation things, you know, they sound great. I want the lowest, highest Q possible. But that also means that uh, you're, you're becoming more and more sensitive to these slight pullings. Right? So you have to, have to, have to think about that. Okay, so now, the role of two-level systems. I just mentioned uh, briefly that the, uh, the mechanical device has a temperature dependence, and that temperature dependence is, is uh, it's a well-expected and well-measured well thing. It's been measured, you know, uh, people have been looking at two-level systems in class for since the 70s, so it's, it's physics that's been, uh, it's, it's well-known. So, let me tell you a little bit more about the two-level system and how they uh, produce <coughs> another parametric instability. So <coughs> this one was through the optical spring effect. Um, we went on to, uh, you know, <coughs> the nitrogen titanium nitride was a nightmare. Uh, we went back to try to, you know, we're funded by DARPA. We meet every six months. We got to have some results with this stuff. So we're like, okay, we know aluminum works really well. <coughs> you know, the silicon nitride the mechanical devices work really well. Let's 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 step back from advanced <coughs> material and just. Uh, see what we can get to work with something more straightforward. That should satisfy our needs. And you know, in the end, we're just trying to get below the zero point level as, uh, for one quadrature. That's, that's, that's our goal. So we made a device that looked like this. This is the capacitor. Uh, this is the top plate. And underneath it is a silicon nitride membrane that you can just barely see. And on that membrane is this small electrode as well. So it forms a capacitor. And the mechanical motion is the silicon nitride membrane. The top plate also has modes. And so this device has many mechanical modes. Okay? So when you look at it, you don't find just one, one mode like a uh, wire or whatever. 
you find that you can find many modes that can get upconverted in your cavity. It can be very useful because you can have a couple modes. The mode spacing, the mechanical mode spacing, is actually uh, narrower than the wide width of the cavity. So you can have a couple modes in your cavity for, for a given problem. Okay, so then we spot and we make an inductor around this thing. We feed microwaves in, we detect microwaves coming out. Uh, there's kind of an edge on view showing the gap. Uh, it's about a 100 nanometer gap in there. So there you go, that's, that's a simple device. Another view, gap, this is aluminum, there's aluminum, there's silicon nitride. Okay, so two level systems, just a tiny, a tiny introduction to it. Uh, the, the classic work in a review paper is, is from Phillips here from 87. And um, the idea is that there's some sort of defects in the material that uh, have maybe two positions that they can, they can, they, they can reside in, right? two possible states. And so you can imagine like an energy landscape like this, where I'm, I'm here, but you know, I could also be over here. There's some energy barrier you have to get over. Um, there's some energy difference between the two wells. So people make wild assumptions, you know, and it, uh, with this kind of model, the de how the distribution of these two level systems are, um, and then they go and compute. And you find out that you can actually uh, calculate, uh, with some reasonable agreement, the speed of sound correction of glass, the mechanical quality factor of glass. Uh, so this two level system model, although it seems super ad hoc, it's a very unsatisfying thing in a lot of ways, it captures a lot of physics that you observe. Um, there's kind of a, a, a renaissance of this kind of uh, thought and thinking due to measurements that have gone on in the superconducting uh, qubit world and also the superconducting detectors. Uh, this is a, the uh, guy was a PhD student at Caltech and he has a really great thesis which explores two level system physics in superconducting resonators. It's, a, it's for if you want a, one place to go and go take a look, see how this stuff works out, that's a good spot. Okay, so there's lots of, and uh, Martinez and Cleland have been looking at two-level systems uh, as well in their, their systems. So here's how, here's how it appears in these kind of measurements. Um, here's the cavity, so the electrical resonator versus temperature. And uh, it, so it, it has a frequency dependent, a temperature dependence. Like everything will, if you look close enough, it will have a temperature dependence. Um, this temperature dependence, at the, the gross feature here is due to the fact that the, the condensate of the superconductor is actually, you know, it's, it goes, to, it's the condensate uh, density is zero at the transition temperature, it's some full value at zero temperature, so there's there's some temperature dependence of the condensate number, and that's the that's what's going on here. But then if you look close in, there's also a little dip down, and that's 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 the dip down, all the red points, and this is kind of classic response of a of a two level system. Uh, the, in the electrical resonators, it's a dielectric that's, um, you know, it's a lossy, it acts, the two level systems can act as a lossy dielectric. And right when h bar omega and kbt are about one, uh, are equal to each other, then uh, um, then you have this kind of maximum frequency pulling. So this kind of feature here is ubiquitous, you see it in many of the electrical resonators, um, so it's kilohertz kind of, kind of pulling. There's another effect that you can see is that you can look at the, the line width of the electrical resonator versus how hard you pump, and you'll see that the line width actually narrows as you pump harder. And eventually it saturates when you pump hard enough. And what's going on here is that the microwave photons inside this electrical resonator are exciting these two level systems, and eventually once the population is, is equally distributed up and down, then there's no more effect here. This is when you've saturated the two level system absorbers. All these, this data is consistent with about eight nanometers of oxide with a loss angle of, of 10 to the minus five, which is typical for kind of a glassy oxide um, a coating our electrical resonator, right? So there's just 10 nanometers of oxide on these capacitor plates, and that can produce this kind, these kind of signals here. Okay. The levels that we've seen and fit in our data are, are pretty ubiquitous. You see them in almost all the metals, the superconducting metals. In Here's the, uh, the cavity uh, shift versus how hard you're, you're pumping. All right, so this is, um, so yeah, so the math, it, there's a huge model for this two level system stuff, and you can go through the math, go through the fitting, and um, 
and anyway, you can you can fit how the how the cavity uh, shifts its frequency depending on how hard you pump here. Okay. Okay. So once again, you can take all these measurements and you can fit them to a reasonable model that that's seen in other experiments. Um, you know, you're at least agreeing with other people's bad decisions or good decisions about how how they uh, model this stuff. But it, it's it's a common it's a very common uh, 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 density of two level systems that we're all talking about. Okay, so where does the where does the instability come in this case? The instability comes from um, if I have a single tone measurement and uh, and I and I start applying power, I see the frequency shift. Okay, so if you're doing a single tone measurement and your frequency is pulling, why don't you just um, move your tone? Okay, now that sounds fine for single tone. For double tone, you can't do it. You got to keep them spaced by the mechanical frequency. Um, the mechanical device also as you so as you pull as with a single tone, <coughs> if you, you start increasing your pump, the cavity shifts, but the cavity, you no longer have your, your, your tuning just right for your pump tone. So the fact that the cavity is kind of sliding means that you're on this optical spring, and that pulls your mechanical frequency down. Right? So this is the optical spring effect for, this is the detuning, sorry, the symbols got messed up. This is the, the detuned, um, uh, the, the, the detuning of your pump, and you you essentially, if you're tuned just right, you're uh, you know, so you're tuned on the red side by omega mechanical, detuned by omega mechanical, then you should have no uh, optical spring effect, and then as you move yourself away from that, then you slide up and down here, you're going to pull your mechanical frequency. So here's the instability. So if you have two tones, and your power inside your cavity is being modulated at twice the mechanical frequency then your, your cavity is being pulled back and forth here, and that pulls back and forth your mechanical device, the, the frequency of your mechanics. And once again, you have another, another parameter instability. Okay, so we're working on this result. We'll, we'll, we'll publish something at some point about this, just to clean up the, the, uh, the, this, this, the, the model and the discussion of this. But the point is this, is that the dielectric in your electrical resonator is nonlinear. And that, when you pump it, can pull your cavity, and then that can, through optical springs, pull your mechanical frequency. That's the idea. So once again, this is more data showing the mechanical frequency pulling versus temperature. Uh, this is two level systems of the same, you know, in the same device that I just was showing. It's the same density of two level systems that can also explain the mechanical frequency pulling as well. So the two level system model can work for the mechanical system and the electrical system. Um, there, there you go. And I think, uh, oh yeah, the last thing I want to say is for the students who are doing fabrication, um, how you do the fabrication matters on the density of two level systems in the loss angle. So, you know, this, this is a hard comparison to make because the devices were, had different performance, but whether you do a thermal evaporation with a really low base pressure and a reasonable deposition rate, then you get a loss angle of your dielectric of 10 minus 5. Or if you do an e-beam evaporation, which is kind of a common e-beam evaporator where people are evaporating all kinds of crazy stuff, um, with the worst base pressure at a slower rate, then you get a worse loss angle. So the fabrication matters. We also have some evidence that the, uh, the etchants that you use for your aluminum, if you, those etchants oxidize your aluminum, then you could also have uh, a loss angle change as well. So given that the density of two level systems is kind of 10 to minus 5 and 10 nanometers is pretty ubiquitous, it, it puts some real brakes on, on what we can imagine with these, with these kind of electrical circuits at some point. You can't, um, you know, the gap's gonna get smaller and smaller, but it's not clearly decreasing the gap is always helpful because you have the dielectric is even a bigger fraction of the, of the, of the dielectric, you know, the, the capacitor, the capacitance. Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about is, is actually going to, instead of modulating the capacitor with motion, going to modulate the inductor and change the impedance of the circuit so that the voltages inside the circuit are much lower and just work with a modulated inductor. So it's a Meisner, using the Meisner effect. And that's something that we've been thinking about. You know, any kind of, when you change the fabrication of any of this stuff, you're looking at months of, at least months of, of, of working on a new recipe. So this is the direction ultimately we're headed. Okay, so then uh, talking to Steve about this, uh, Steve had an interesting idea. I just wanted to share it. Whether the red really is the bad. The, um, there's a, the problem is, is that the pump is the, the power inside the cavity is oscillating at twice the mechanical frequency. 
So by adding in uh, another tone, if you, smear, if you square all this up, you know, here's the voltage. So here's the two red and blue tones. And then if I add in a, another tone at 3 omega, you can actually get an interference so that there's no power appearing at twice the mechanical frequency. Right? And um, that's an interesting thing. And we actually tried that out just a little bit, uh, adding in a third tone and then changing the, the phase, adjusting that interference between all these different peak cosines here. And in fact, you can adjust the mechanical damping doing that. So that seems like there are ways out. If you've you got problems with things oscillating at 2 omega, by adding in some more tones, you can try to get interferences so that the oscillations happen at you know, 4 omega and at, 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 at uh, 0, <coughs> single, at, at just omega. So there's, anyway, there's ways to move the power around through interference. OK. Um, yeah, so that's the, those are the lessons. You know, those are the lessons of hard, hard knocks of, uh, of this kind of physics. Um, what I wanted to do, and I, how long do I have? It's not, so maybe another 10. Okay. Yeah. So, so next 10 minutes, let me let me. Tell you, I'm an optimist. I, you know, I really love uh, doing these kind of low temperature physics experiments. They're a lot of fun. This this last period has been really challenging with these instabilities. Um, but we're always trying to think of new and weird things, weird things to do. And ultimately, you know, when I was uh, getting involved in this mechanical stuff back, you know, 12 years ago, it was actually considered kind of weird and a weird thing to do. So it's it's like, yeah. So now now there's it's, it's a community. It's fascinating. There's things <coughs> going on. What other kind of strange experiments can we imagine? And one thing I've been thinking about is a uh, superfluid man. Superfluid is has perfect motion, right? So uh, if you take a ring of superfluid, helium four, and uh, copper tubing, and you make a little ring, you put uh, helium in it, it becomes a liquid at four kelvin, and then uh, superfluid at two kelvin. You can get current going around this ring that's persistent; it doesn't stop. You come back tomorrow, it's still going around the ring. Not only that, the the current goes around the ring, it's, the motion's quantized. It'll only flow around the ring at discrete speeds. It's totally wild, it's totally weird. But when we're thinking about quantum mechanical effects, of, you know, limits of motion, superfluid's a pretty interesting material for perfect motion, right? So the, the persistent currents have been known about for a long time. Uh, when I was a grad student, I used those persistent currents as an inertial reference to detect the rotation of the Earth. But Maybe there's things that we can do with mechanical properties of fluid, superfluid. Right? I was trying to think of the ultimate material. Like sapphire is an amazing material mechanically. It's got at one Kelvin, sapphire has, has been measured in the 70s to have a mechanical Q of a billion, 10 to the 9. And its electrical Q is also 10 to the 9. Right? You can build whispering gallery modes with that kind of Q. So maybe there'd be something interesting with uh, using superfluid as sort of the ultimate low-loss material. So that's something we've been exploring with the grad student. And here's some of the properties. So superfluid is really soft. The speed of sound is 10 times smaller than most metals. So it's a real squishy fluid. Uh, the density is very low. It's, it's, you know, I returned to Dewar. My first Dewar I ever picked up when I was a grad student, I returned it back to the liquefier at Berkeley to tell the liquefier guy that it was empty because I it clearly didn't have 200 pounds of mass if it were water. And then he explained this back to me, that it's about one-seventh water. Uh, the dielectric constant is, is, is small, just 5% difference in vacuum. The vacuum. Um, it's chemically totally pure. So when someone says that silicon is the purest material known to man, they just don't know about uh, helium. Uh, helium has no impurities. All the impurities stick to the wall. <coughs> so when you have a cup of superfluid, it's a cup of superfluid. There's nothing else in it. The only impurities that you have are isotopic impurities. So there's helium-3 uh, mixed in with the helium-4. Natural concentration of those helium-3 impurities is around part 10 to the minus 7. And there's ways of purifying it using the superfluid motion um, to get it down to under 10 to the minus 14 fraction of helium-3. So not only is it chemically totally pure, it can be isotopically extremely pure. So it, it has a transition to kelvin, which is easily accessible. So you can get far below that on the dilution equation. Now you have a pure cup of superfluid. Um, the entropy resides in most at low temperatures in the phonons, at higher temperature near the transition, there's these things called rotons, nobody really knows what they are. But the phonons, uh, and they exponentially disappear, and they're gapped. But the phonons are just the sound modes of the, of the fluid. OK, so this is what we're imagining. This is kind of the concept. Uh, this is our you know, zeroth order uh, device. 
a copper can, and this is big, yeah, and uh, it's heavy and stiff, and it has a, uh, you can put a top on it and make a TE011 resonator, so it's a microwave resonator, and um, you can fill it with fluid. And when the superfluid moves and, you know, has an acoustic mode inside that can, it changes the density, the density profile of the fluid changes, which changes the dielectric constant, which then shifts, pulls the frequency of the cap. So that's the idea. So that the, the motion of the superfluid, the acoustic motion of the superfluid, will modulate the electrical resonance of the cavity. So it's an optomechanical circuit again, right? 12 gigahertz cavity, three kilohertz motion of the fluid. Okay, so what's known about the dissipation in, in the superfluid? Um, so <coughs> the, the, the effect where the where dissipation comes from in superfluid is it's not a friction kind of process, it's just an up and down conversion out of the mode that you're, that you're interested in. So you have this three kilohertz mode, but there's a background of phonons in, in the fluid, and there's a nonlinear spring constant of the fluid. It's not a perfectly linear uh, restoring force. And that's captured by this, uh, this parameter, this uh, uh, Grunison parameter, which basically says how the speed of sound changes for the fractional density change. Okay, so this is the coupling. There's a, just a nonlinearity of the spring constant, which takes energy out of the mood that you're interested in, and it's going to up or down convert it into, into other places. So there's a big battle in the field if you go look through these old papers between the Americans and the Russians over how this should work and you know dispersion relationships that explain it or can't work or whatever. And eventually it was figured out uh, that it has to do with a surprising uh, um, sign of this coefficient on the dispersion relationship for, for, uh, for sound in the, in the fluid. So anyway, you can come up with a pretty compact formula for the attenuation length for sound and um, and that's what's fit here, this t to the fourth attenuation here. This was measured back in the 1950s. So the attenuation length, that if you extrapolate from 10 to the 100 millipeg down to 10 millipeg, and from megahertz down to kilohertz, you find out that the attenuation uh, length goes to absurdly long lengths. So, you know, 3 billion meters uh, at a 10 millikelvin to you know, 10 to the 13 meters for uh, one millikelvin. And superfluid in four, you can cool to 100 microkelvin. That's a that, that's a uh, experiment we were doing at, at Berkeley when I was a grad student. We would achieve a cup full of superfluid at those kinds of temperatures. Okay, so the other dissipation mechanism is um, is from the helium three impurities, which are normal material. It acts as a dilute gas inside this inside this uh, superfluid, and there's going to be friction from that. And because it's just a normal, it's just a normal material. There's friction both from thermal, when the sound wave compresses this stuff, there's both thermal effects and the viscosity effects. So you can, you can calculate all that, all that's known how to calculate. Um, and what we come up with is a quality factor for the acoustic mode in superfluid versus, uh, versus temperature, and for different very concentrations of helium-3 in the superfluid. And so, <coughs> For kind of nominal 10 minus 6, 10 minus 7, depending on what you read, what's nominal in uh, in uh, uh, in the stuff you would just get out of uh, from from the liquefier, um, we expect to hit you know Q's of 10 to the 9 for just nominal purity helium 4. And then if you start purifying, then you can reach reach values that are pretty extraordinary. 10 to the 9 has been achieved mechanically for silicon bar and for uh, sapphire. So we'd like to see if we can get beyond that, get to a resonator that goes farther. Okay, um, let me just try to, I'll just try to summarize it quickly. So then there's, there's a, a you, you put it in a container. So we thought about suspending the drop, of, the drop of superfluid, but that has problems that you've lost all thermal contact with it, you can't get below something like 200 millikelvin. And it's also true that the, the suspension will also be connected to whatever you, the drug will also be connected to the outside suspension through whatever force you're using. So it's not as isolated as you might, as you might think. So we ended up going with this can idea. The problem with the can is that the can stretches when the superfluid acoustic wave is, is, is excited. And so you can compute how much the can stretches, how much energy is, is, is residing in the can compared to how much energy is in the superfluid motion. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, 3, 10 minus 4 for the copper can that I showed you. It's known what the quality factors dissipation angle is for various metals at low temperatures. 
or copper is 10 to 5, or niobium is you can get 40 billion, for sapphire you can get 5 billion. It's incredible. That will that'll limit what the ultimate Q due to acoustic radiation into the can, and friction in the can, uh, to these kind of values here. So for a copper can, we think it's limited to 10 to the 8. For niobium, you can start getting 10 to the 11. For sapphire, you're, you're at the 10 to 13. The real challenge is how do you hold on to this can without being losing it up into your fridge? And that'll be the, the real engineering challenge of this whole thing. OK, so this is how it couples. It couples, there's an uh, acoustic wave, then there's an electromagnetic mode. And when you deplete material in the low pressure part, you're putting it into the ends where there's less electric field. That's why the frequency gets pulled. OK. Uh, oh, yeah. So, one interesting thing is that when you work through all the couplings, you find out that you should be able to get to uh, the so-called quantum limit, the oscillator so-called limit, uh, with around 10 to the 12 microwave photons in the can. And that corresponds to something like a volt per meter inside the can. So it's not an absurdly high pump strength you need to be able to get to detect, detect the motion of this 10 gram object down to, down to a certain principle. So one thing you could ask is like, is this thing is this thing a gravitational wave detector? Could you do you know, let's say it's just magic. This thing you know, ultimately does have this high Q. It's a it's a massive object and has very low friction. Could you detect a one kilohertz uh, gravitational wave going by? And you know the numbers don't don't look so it's not it's not anything greater than what's uh, than what's being done. I mean maybe it's you know maybe it's somehow smaller and if a bunch of people decided to try to make this work, maybe you could make it work. I don't know, but. My numbers uh, suggest, so you can go through some old, old papers. There's a book from, uh, from Blair, which gives some calculations about how to imagine a gravitational wave going by, which is kind of just impulsive, kicking this resonator. And um, I compute that we should be able to detect a, a strain. Uh, if we had a one meter blob of this superfluid, you can get down to 10 minus 21 uh, strain in the, in the space-time field. And, um, but for our resonator at uh, kilohertz, um, then we're at 10 to the 12, so it really stinks. And it's just that the mass is low, the coupling is low. So this is just improving as the mass just grows, so you get more energy deposited in the air. <coughs> so I don't think it's particularly uh, favorable for gravitational waves. Um, last thing that I just want to mention here is that we're considering another uh, type of uh, container for this thing, is to use a sapphire disk. And we've had these things made, I should take some nice pictures of it, but we, we sent it back out to be bonded. Uh, we've, made, we've had sapphire pieces that are made that are split, and then they machine a groove into it. And it's about you know, a hand-sized object. And they drill a really fine hole into this thing that we're going to fill up with the superfluid. So there's a whispering gallery mode that can go around the sapphire, and that couples to the acoustic motion of the superfluid running around the thing. So the microwave uh, frequency cues in sapphire can be 10 to the 9, and the mechanical cues can be 10 to the 9. So sapphire is a really promising material. The thing that scares me, the reason uh, we have a copper can and also we, we've uh, designed a niobium can as well. We have 20 pounds of niobium that we're going to make a niobium can out of. Um, is this bond here for the sapphire? I think sapphire is the best material to do this, but the bond has to be super fluidly tight. And the guys who do the bonding are just uh, familiar with doing optical uh, quality bonding. Uh, we don't know, you know whether that's sufficient for, uh, for you know, super fluid can run through a, a, a couple inch of channel. So will it, will it leak? Uh, some interesting numbers is that the lifetime for a single quanta coming in and out of the resonator. So the, the, the acoustic resonator is, is highly thermally populated, right? It's a kilohertz oscillator. Even at, the, you know, our, our fridge has a base temperature we measure at 5, five and a half millikelvin. So even at these temperatures, uh, it's still thermally excited. But you can ask for the time for it to change one quanta. And the Q, if the cues we can get, our mechanical cues are high enough, then these time scales can actually become a second, 10 second, 100 second, 1,000 seconds. So, you know, make, you know, it's interesting that it, it remains in one quantum state for, for a long time. Okay, the other, the last, this is the last slide on this, and uh, I'll stop. The, um, the, one of the, the, so there's gravitational waves, it doesn't look that great for it. The only way to get, to detect gravitational waves is a big mass, right? Um, the, the, the sensitivity of a little can like this to accelerations and forces is really extraordinary. And imagine that the superfluid you just modeled as a, as a mass, and then its own compressibility is a spring. 
So the, the mass is 10 grams, uh, the frequency is 3 kilohertz, so that turns out to be a spring constant of a really stiff spring. Let's say you go to 10 millikelvin and you're at Q of 10 to the 10, this is, this is a number. Um, so if I have an internal mass spring like this, and I shape the outside boundary, so I have this, I have a little, I have a little box and there's a mass spring inside, and I shake the box. And if I do that exactly on the mechanical resonance, the motion inside of the, of the spring inside is Q times bigger than the motion of that you excited with it. Okay, not a surprising result. But the point is, is that this motion is much bigger. Suppose that we, we cooled the mechanical device and thermally and isolated well enough that we actually sat in the thermal limit for this uh, 3 kilohertz resonator. That'd be about a, a tenth of a femtometer. And we think we can detect down near the SQL, so we think we can detect these kinds of motions. So that means that if, if, uh, if we shook this device Q times smaller than 10 to the minus 16, we should be able to detect that. So the, we're sensitive to the boundary moving at 10 to the minus 26 meters if we can keep the mechanical device uh, in its thermal state at 10 to the, the 10 to the 10 to the meter. So that's insane. That's an insane number. Um, you know, well, I'm sure we'll have vibrations that'll excite like this thing, but you know, maybe someday somebody wants to thermally isolate this. Uh, the fractional change in the in this compared to the length is you know 10 to the minus 25. Uh, the kind of accelerations we're talking about are 10 to the minus 18 g's. Okay, so it's really it's really tiny. You can excite this mass spring with 10 grams oscillating by one centimeter at 10 meters away. So just through gravity, just through gravity. If I shake something long enough and wait long enough, then I should see this thing excite. So I don't know where this thing goes. I don't know why you do this, but it's it's why wouldn't you do this? So this is, <laughs> It's, uh, it's this crazy superfluid condensate. Eventually, we'll have a niobium can, which is some crazy electric electronic condensate, and then them coupled together. Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. At least I find it interesting. Okay, so that's that's basically it. There's a lot of challenges I can list here. Um, I didn't have time to talk about it, an experiment that we're proposing with Marcus Aspenmeyer, where we're thinking about small masses in free fall, and to try to get away from any sort of suspension. All together, either from lasers which hold the uh, hold the the particle um, or tethers or anything like that, and to see what sort of is an ultimate limit. If you want to do quantum mechanics with something massive, could you go to the space station and just have your cavity track, you know, free falling with your particle, and just let your particle expand away from you expand? So it's something that Oriel has has worked on. Uh, Marcus and his group has worked on, but it was something that I had thought of a couple of years ago, trying to think, well, what's the ultimate environment to do a mechanical experiment? You know, go to a place where you just don't have to touch it and just let the wave function expand as long as you like. So that, that uh, proposal paper is up on our website, and that's kind of been what, what we've been thinking about. So there you go. There's a little more optimistic vision of the future. I told you a lot about the things that go wrong. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that I like to keep me cheered up and, and uh, fun things to think about.